All right, hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, hopefully uh, everyone uh, got through the weekend okay. Um, welcome back to Noon Conference. So for those who have watched prior Zoom Noon Conferences, about once per month I'm averaging a toxicology mini conference, which is what we're gonna do today. So we've got four tox cases from each of our sites essentially. And we're gonna go through these. Each has a couple more esoteric teaching points and then some more high yield stuff for semi-regular admissions. So with that, uh, I'm sitting in the room with some VA residents and we're gonna defer to them or people of the chat uh, about which case you guys would wanna start with. So either throw in the chat or people in the room, uh, which case do you wanna start with? Toad. All right, so we're gonna start with Toad. Uh, personally, I'm not a huge Toad fan, but it is what it is. So case two, Toad. So uh, case two toad here. So the chief complaint, the patient states that two nights ago, a friend gave her mushrooms and acid in quotes without telling her. Uh, patient states that she had mild abdominal cramping, uh, nausea, vomiting since, and has had nothing, uh, has not been able to alleviate her symptoms whatsoever. So uh, let's give you some more HPI here. Uh, that ain't it. Uh, so more HPI here. If I can scroll down and find the right one. Here you go. So at about 2 a.m. on Saturday, so 48 hours prior to her admission, she ingested one brownie, which was offered by one of her friends. She did not realize it contained mushrooms plus LSD. Uh, since ingesting, she's experienced hallucinations and refractory nausea. Hasn't eaten anything in two days uh, with generalized abdominal pain and occasional diarrhea. She hasn't urinated in two days either. All of her symptoms began after ingestion. She is uncomfortable appearing and nauseous. All right, so for people in the room or people in the chat, um, what toxidrome or ingestion are we dealing with right now? And um, what do you think about this sort of HPI? Like what problems are you most worried about? Okay, so Meryl says, hasn't urinated in two days. So perhaps sounds anticholinergic, I like it. Okay, but then we've also got this weird complaint of occasional diarrhea. Jordan also agrees with Marilyn, says questionable anticholinergic. Thanks, Jordan. Anything else jump out on this HPI? So Dr. Barry says she needs new friends, which I think is not, a, uh, not an inappropriate suggestion. Um, awesome. So, I mean, I think this is pretty obvious, but right, she is hallucinating, which is, we should all not be hallucinating at baseline. So probably important to keep that in mind. And then the other stuff that jumped out, I think actually when Katie and uh, Divneet on uh, wards were admitting this person was she had sort of generalized abdominal pain and like refractory nausea. So uh, the toxidrome here, anyone want to take a guess at what is causing this toxidrome? The hint is it's listed in the HPI at some point. It's partially the LSD. So if it's partially the LSD and it's driven by something else, what else is in that, that HPI? There you go, and the mushrooms. So this person uh, is suffering from a mushroom poisoning. Mushroom plus the thing that's causing the hallucinations, which if anyone knows is uh, psilocybin. So uh, mushroom poisoning, has anyone ever admitted someone with a mushroom poisoning before? Nice, so Meryl brings up the point, she says like, is this the Amanita phylloides mushroom, right? So is this like, is this the scary mushroom or is this the, I just took some mushrooms with a friend on a Saturday night during a pandemic and now I feel weird mushroom. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's throw up some labs here because I think you guys all got it sort of the heart of it. Um, so here are some labs for this lady. So uh, white count 17.2, I've highlighted the abnormal in red. White count, uh, hemoglobin 15.6, notably on the BMP, her um, creatinine is 1.54. She's a relatively thin and smaller woman and that is well above her baseline, about three times her baseline. The UN is 31, her LFTs are within normal limits. Um, so I think the, 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 obviously the BMP here is abnormal. For either the interns or second year residents, um, how are you guys thinking about this BMP and can you tie it into the mushroom poisoning and the HPI in general? Like what's your early differential and breakdown here?
Cool. So Katie says, Katie says, questionably obstructive. Awesome. So not urinating. Great. Awesome. So Mike says pre renal refractory nausea, vomiting. Perfect. So you guys are, you guys are absolutely correct. So you're hitting like all the really common stuff, which is, is this, you know, obstructive? She's not urinating. Is it pre renal? Cause she's got nothing in her system and she's, you know, not, doesn't have enough flow to her kidneys. Um, is there any way, do you guys think this is related to the mushrooms, unrelated to the mushrooms? Or am I giving you like three separate problems all rolled into one? All right, so I'll tell you the reason this person gets admitted is this is possibly related to the mushrooms. <laughs> and we'll talk about why. So possibly related to the mushrooms. So the first teaching point here is uh, psilocybin toxicity and mushroom poisoning. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to take um, roughly 30 seconds in your group. You can pull up up to date if you need to, to try to simulate what this would be like if you were called this person from the ED. And I want you to give me like three big things you're gonna be worried about if you're getting if you're admitting a person who has mushroom toxicity. And then we'll talk about how toad messes you up. And for the room, I just asked the, uh, the Zoom people, I just asked them to kind of summarize what they found on their 30 second uh, cell phone review. So what syndromes and what comes with mushroom poisoning? Feel free to call it out. Yeah, great, so liver. So even within that broader, so toad's liver right here. So sort of within that broader, you get like a acute GI syndrome. So that can be both a gastroenteritis or if uh, in case what Meryl was talking about, like acute liver failure, if you do the Amanita phylloides. But generally speaking, it's gonna be an acute gastroenteritis is pretty common. Cool, what else? You guys knocked out one of the big ones. Awesome, so Toad's kidneys right here, great. So you can have a delayed rhabdo as well for muscle breakdown. Perfect. I'll give you the easy one, which is if you have the psilocybin or you have LSD, you also get hallucinations as well. Not all mushrooms have psilocybin in them, uh, only a few do, but if you are hallucinating and you took a mushroom, that's the reason why. The next one that uh, Meryl pointed out early and Jordan pointed out is you can get an anticholinergic toxidrome as well, right? These are not like, these mushrooms are not pure things. There's a bunch of different substances in them. So you can get an anticholinergic toxidrome and then um, anything else that we're missing here. The very last one, the re sorry, say it. Yeah, awesome. So delayed renal failure. So one of our medical students says delayed renal failure, which is perfect. That's why this person's getting admitted is because you want to make sure that they're not going to go into renal failure um, because of the mushrooms. And that renal failure is an intrinsic process. So um, the reason this person gets admitted is because they're A, freaking out, and B, um, they may go into renal failure. Thankfully, this person does not go into renal failure. They get some fluids, the creatinine comes down and they are discharged uh, the very next morning uh, with plans to hopefully uh, not do mushrooms or LSD during a pandemic ever again. Anyone have questions about our first case, which is acute mushroom poisoning?
Cool. At the very worst, I'll have ruined Toad for you guys and you play Mario Kart. I guess the other thing too that why this is pertinent is because Syria was like you now, not Syria, whatever it is, but it's legal, it's legal now in Colorado. So. Yeah, so Corey brings up a good point. So psilocybin now uh, legal in Colorado and a few other states, uh, I believe Oregon as well. And so uh, you will probably, you may see this uh, during your career. Yeah, great question. So the question uh, for people that couldn't hear was, uh, is it the psilocybin uh, that's doing all this or is this just a general mushroom toxidrome and does the psilocybin make it more likely? So kind of a two-part answer, the psilocybin is what causes the hallucinations and then the mushroom toxidrome is everything else. So mushrooms themselves are associated with the rhabdo, renal failure, gastroenteritis, and then the psilocybin by itself causes hallucinations. So, no, good question. So you couldn't have a shiitake mushroom. So uh, there are thousands and thousands of mushroom species in the world. Uh, I don't have time to list all of them and I don't know all of them, um, but some are poisonous, some are not. So the other, the other key is don't just eat mushrooms you find in the woods. Um, so yeah, mushroom foragers and people who like to party might be the two people you will see uh, coming in with this. Yeah, and Meryl brings up that mushroom foraging is a real thing. It's similar to bonsai growing. It's one of these niche, uh, one of these niche hobbies that some of our attendings engage in. All right, so case two, uh, what do you guys want to do? We've knocked out Toad for case one. He was obviously mushrooms. Mike, you're up. What do you want to do? <laughs> Which one? Uh, that, is a, that is a fish. Uh, so we, we're going to talk with Mike. At, we're going to have Mike do a mocha after this. So he's a shark. All right, so this is a fish. So this is a case from the VA about a couple weeks ago. So a patient came to the ED with a chief complaint of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, chills, lower back aches, skin itching, started at 9 p.m. tonight. Says he ate seafood restaurant around 6 p.m. So uh, he's a 30 year old man with GERD, nausea, vomiting, uh, went to dinner around 6 p.m. He had shrimp, lobster and salmon. At 9 p.m. he got nauseous, vomited, had the sweats without fevers, diffuse itching and abdominal pain. This has never happened to him before. And he says, I have no allergies. So uh, take 30 seconds amongst yourselves. And I want people to give me the top two things they think could be going on right here. So we'll go with uh, we'll go with table one in the far corner here, Merrill's table. Um, what was your guys like top two differential? Very say that say that a little louder. Allergic reaction versus scombroid. Awesome. So uh, Viri, what is scombroid for poisoning or scombroid? Awesome. So Viri said it's from basically inadequate fish preparation. Uh, it's a toxin and anyone in the population can have that, that reaction regardless of whether you have an allergy to fish, which is perfect. So Viri did an awesome job. That is exactly the top two. You're thinking allergic reaction and you're thinking scombroid as well. And we'll talk about what scombroid is here in just a second. So um, if you're presented with these two things, put yourself in the place of the ED provider. I will tell you that this person's vital signs are um, all normal. Um, what would you give this person for treatment right now? Or would you admit and then say, hey, medicine team, you guys can figure this one out? So we have a question of, do we give these people charcoal? So do we get the fish out of their system the way it came? Supportive care. We've, we've 
invoked a supportive care clause. Great. No one knows what that means. So we just, we're just going to wave our hands and say we've supported you. And then Jordan is saying, should we give them uh, something to block histamine? Awesome. So uh, we are indeed going to give them something to block histamine. So this person in the ED gets an IV dose of Benadryl and is essentially cured on the spot. They feel uh, immensely better and uh, are ready to go home when some labs return. So these are this person's labs in the ED. They're sitting there waiting to go home. They're about to be handed their discharge paperwork and the ED attending is like, ah, I can't let you leave anymore. We're gonna admit you to medicine for further workup of your LFT abnormalities. So um, this is sort of a yes, no question for the room. Um, are you guys able, is, is, are the LFT abnormality, so acute liver injury, is that part of the scombroid poisoning or is that something else? Cool, Viri is like, I think this is something else. And Viri is correct, this is something else. So um, at this point, right, we actually have to do our jobs, take a history and admit the person and kind of go from there. So uh, let's take another 30 seconds at your tables and I want everyone to talk about what their approach is to uh, isolated elevated liver enzymes. So what do you order and what do you ask the patient? Uh, AST is on the left, ALT is on the right, uh, both are elevated. And I'll tell you, on the recheck, both these go to 600 and 500, and then 300. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's, well, wait a minute. so interns, you guys are going to have to do this work up yourself uh, when you're admitting people in just a few months. Um, and so um, one of the interns in there, give me your approach when you see isolated elevated, elevated liver enzymes. The alpha, yeah, alpha is on the bottom. So, um, so I guess like with the just the ASC and LT on the like you know, like alcohol, like substitutes, like alcohol, like substitutes, any like medication changes. Um, I, even though they're not like extremely high, like I, I always get like that like that day, especially just as a Cool. No, I think that's great. So Mike, for those that couldn't hear, I'll just quickly summarize. He said he talks about alcohol, substances, medications. He gets hep serologies for almost everyone. And then Mike, would you get imaging for this person based on their story? Um, probably yeah. So, and what imaging would you order? Cool. And what are you ordering? Uh, just so, just to, when you just like diagnostic and sort of reasoning when you get that right upper quadrant ultrasound, like what do you, what is your branch point when you get that scan? Like how I detect it. Mm -hmm. Or no, like if you if you're gonna get that that scan back, right? You should have in your in your mind like what am I gonna see on this scan and what would I do if I see it? So you're not just on a fishing expedition, no yeah, pun intended. So with the like the LA alpha. Awesome. I like it. So things you can act on. So right, ductal dilation, uh, steatosis to kind of help help with your differential. I love it. Okay. So I'll tell you, you do all this workup. This person does not drink. 
Uh, he doesn't use any meds, but when you're asking about substances, he says that he uses something called a Nutra One preparation, which he buys at GNC. Um, so presented with that information, how do you how do you look into the supplement more? I think it's like a, I, I heard of cases of like um, like supplements and then causing like mild like severe injury. There's like a like an app that I do that that can like measure the quality of that. Oh, Mike, you're like a plant in the room. I love it. So for those who have never done this before, this is uh, something called the liver tox database. And I would highly recommend um, that you either bookmark this or become very familiar with this. And so this is a, um, an, it's an NIH uh, group essentially, and they keep this updated with all sorts of case reports on various things that cause liver toxicity. So uh, if you have a supplement and you can Google it and find what's in it, you can go to this database, put in any supplement and it'll tell you whether or not it's associated with uh, LFT abnormalities, acute liver injury, biliary injury, things like that. Super useful database, and I would uh, highly encourage you to include it in all of your LFT workups uh, if you don't have a clear reason. So uh, you ask this guy, he tells you the name of the, of, the, uh, of the supplement, and you go online and you see there's something called Cascara in it. Is anyone familiar with Cascara? I'll be shocked if anyone raises their hand. Cool, cascara. So what is cascara? Cascara is from a plant. Uh, this is gonna be part of the esoteric knowledge here. So uh, cascara is from um, a plant which grows predominantly in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, not really in Colorado, um, but essentially it is a uh, herbal laxative. And so we've been using it for centuries to help uh, with bowel movements. And so it's usually pretty well tolerated, but if you take more than the recommended amount and no one really knows what that is for anywhere from weeks to months, you can predispose yourself to an acute liver injury. Um, and so the treatment here is telling him to stop taking the Nutri One supplement um, and hopefully avoiding all sorts of cascara related products. Any questions about cascara and liver tox before we go back to the more interesting part, the fish? Yeah, Meryl says she's amazed by the number of supplements, which is exactly correct. That's why you should ask about it, because people will not tell you about their GNC supplements and you, unless you specifically ask them. Uh, and almost everything, you could probably find a case report associated with some sort of uh, drug-induced damage. All right. Sorry, repeat the first part of that one more time. Mm -mm, no. Um, so one of the students is saying there's a database called Natural Medicines as well. Um, and does that give you like medical stuff on it or is that like ingredients or? Um, I think it gives you more kind of like the research of what like overall what the, like, the research community thinks about these stuff. Um, because hmm. it's just like kind of boring. Like, hey, for fish oil, like this is what it could be for whatever. And then like basically it tells you what the evidence is for using that or not. Cool. Um, so it sounds like this like natural med uh, database gives you sort of like the research behind each supplement, which I was not aware of, which is actually a pretty cool uh, resource. All right. So for those of you who are wondering, is Danny going to show us a breakdown of all the fish poisonings? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, you never miss an opportunity to show a differential for fish poisonings. So uh, this is something uh, that we're going to go through really briefly here. Eric told me if I had more than a minute on this, he would throw a tomato at me. Uh, so uh, the one that we're all working with today, right, is the scombroid poisoning, which comes from uh, contaminated fish. So you get improper storage of the fish, which causes histidine to go to histamine. And so you end up getting a histamine poisoning. So scombroid, kind of a confusing name, but what it's really telling you is that this person has a histamine overdose and you're giving them some sort of histamine blocking agent or uh, epinephrine if it's severe enough. So that's the one we're working with today. The next one is something called ciguatera from the ciguatoxin. That's a reef fish, which we don't see a lot of in Colorado. And the reason that happens is the fish eat the algae and the algae produces the ciguatoxin. You have the ciguatoxin um, and you get a combination of uh, GI and neuro symptoms. So one of the big takeaways for all fish poisonings is your neuro symptoms all pretty much look the same. It's uh, some combination of paralysis and paresthesias. And depending on which toxin you're getting, you get some, some combination, one of those symptoms, both of those symptoms, uh, but paralysis and paresthesias. The next group is the neurotoxic group. That's your shellfish eating from the red tides. Uh, not too much more to say on that other than how do you differentiate that from the ciguatoxin? It's time of onset. 
So this is roughly three hours, that time window before it starts, whereas ciguatoxin is gonna be uh, anywhere from basically three hours to 72 hours. So if the person tells you I had fish two days ago and now I'm sick, think ciguatoxin. If it was three hours ago, think the neurotoxins. Then you get to your paralytics. These are essentially the same as the neurotoxins, but it's a different type. It's the bivalve mollusk. So clams, uh, mussels, things like that. Again, it's the red tides and climate change. And then the very last one, the one that uh, hopefully we never see is the puffer fish. So uh, the blowfish in Japan, if it's in prepare, uh, prepared improperly, you can get the tetrodotoxin, which is uh, one of the most dangerous toxins on the planet uh, and can kill you within a matter of minutes. So if you were told that someone died after eating blowfish, Congratulations, you've made the diagnosis. Uh, if you see someone after eating blowfish, think tetrodotoxin. Uh, notably, if you see someone after they eat blowfish, please let me know uh, for a conference in the future. <laughs> Any questions about uh, our bad fish differential diagnosis, sort of when to think about these complaints that this is too esoteric? Yeah, so Meryl's asking, do we have treatments for all these? And the answer is we do not. We have treatments for none of these. Um, and so this is another one of those times when we just sort of generally invoke supportive care uh, and kind of go from there. And so the other unfortunate thing is some of, these, uh, some of these toxins can last for a while. And so you have the immediate effects and then you can have more chronic effects as well. Um, but all of these are supportive care, except for scombroid. Scombroid, right, you're gonna give your uh, H2 blocker. Uh, yeah, that's right back. I was going to say, this is like so perfect because our team just got in the mission overnight who has been having like an urticarial reaction ever since eating sushi. Um, and so we talked a bit about this. So look at that. So people with bad fish issues come in all the time uh, and something to be aware of. Um, cool. Any additional questions about uh, scombroid, anything on this differential? Where to eat blowfish when you're in Japan? Make sure it's a, a place on the up and up. All right, cool. So uh, case number two, the fish right here was uh, scombroid poisoning. So we got two cases left. Uh, do you want to do case three or case four? All right, we're going to do the dog. So the dog, I'll tell you, this is the most upbeat part of this entire case. So buckle up. Yeah, uh, people were worried this was going to be too uh, light a conference. Um, all right, so this person is brought in from, uh, by ambulance from the train station. This is a person that Dr. Rudofker admitted uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, bystanders said the patient had a witness seizure and then was found down in cardiac arrest. When the EMS arrived, they were in V-fib, defibrillated times three. Uh, they got amio, four milligrams of epi, Narcan didn't do anything, and they arrived with a blood pressure of 110 over 60. All right, so I'll give you Eric's additional history here. He couldn't get much, um, obviously, but the additional history he gets is that the friend told EMS that the patient was huffing keyboard cleaner earlier that day, then seized and went into cardiac arrest. So uh, we're gonna have time to sort of like talk a little bit more about keyboard cleaner, um, but the immediate thing, right, is keeping this person alive. And so Eric gets this person up to the MICU and he sees this on the monitor. So uh, we'll kind of play this like real life. You see this, you see this rhythm, you don't have too much time. So everyone take 30 seconds at your table and tell me A, what do you wanna do right now and what you are looking at. So table two, uh, what do you guys want to do? This person is in front of you. You are standing in the room looking at this on the computer. So uh, first question, what rhythm are we looking at? Okay, so we've got someone who thinks this is torsades or TDP. Great. Anyone else think this is something else or does it even matter? Yeah, existentially, does this matter? Immediately, does it matter? 
All right, so we got some people shaking heads saying in the immediate moment, this does not matter. So what do we want to do? Table two, what do you guys want to do for this person? Okay, so you're going to shock. And just so we're all on the same page here, are you going to do a synchronized shock or a defibrillation? And why are you going to do a defib? Perfect. Katie says there's nothing for this machine to localize in on, so you're just going to defib. Perfect. Awesome. And then what else do you want to do? Right, you're going to give mag as well, because maybe this is torsades. Perfect. All right, so you give the shock, you give the mag, and then this person converts to a sinus tack. Everyone takes a deep breath, and then Dr. Rudofker, future cardiologist, walks in the room and waxes poetically about what the rhythm is. So, Eric, uh, tell us what rhythm are we looking at and why? Yeah, um, so when I saw the top line, I thought it might be torsades, and that really clued me into maybe there's a QCT. Um, but actually, if you just look at the second strip, you don't really get that same impression of um, uh, there being like kind of an organized peak and then narrowing and then peak, you know, the twisting of the joint. And so this is really too fast and too disorganized to be torsade. If you look at the rate, if you look at the small boxes, um, one small box being a rate of 300, the rate here is far. Um, greater than 300 even. Uh, and so even though we might, from a, a 20 feet across the room, say, oh yeah, that's for that, this would have stopped to be defib rather than um, a beat tap. Awesome. So um, Eric said this was actually VFib and the take on point there is it's too fast and too disorganized. But you guys hit the nail on the head. It actually didn't matter in the moment what you were doing. Yes, maybe it pushed you more to give mag, but mag isn't the thing this person needs. This person needs electricity first and foremost. And so saying shock uh, was the correct answer there. So you get this person back and then uh, you're sitting there and you're like, oh gosh, what am I gonna do next? What caused this? So has anyone ever seen anyone huff keyboard cleaner before or admitted anyone who huffed keyboard cleaner? Huff keyboard cleaner yourself. <laughs> Oh, so Merrill's invoking the whip it as the youngins say, uh, no comment on that. All right, so uh, I actually can't do this any more justice than the excellent tox note did. And so the teaching point here is please always read the tox notes. They're incredible uh, and they are always helpful. So let's take a look at this tox note here. And I'm just gonna read this in full here because it's honestly like the best summary I can think of. So halogenated hydrocarbons are used recreationally to elicit a sense of euphoria the exact mechanism by which halogenated hydrocarbons cause this effect is not known, and euphoria is frequently followed by a second stage of CNS depression. But however, beyond that, the most concerning side effect of inhaled hydrocarbons is they can lead to cardiac arrest, presumably by sensitizing the myocardium and predisposing the heart to dysrhythmias when exposed to catecholamines. It's frequently termed sudden sniffing death, hence the dog on the first page, and is classically described when a person is using halogenated hydrocarbons, is startled, and then arrests. This patient has no history of being frightened or startled, which is a crazy thing to write in a note for a person who just arrested, um, but potential concomitant use of methamphetamine, uh, which here is her UDS, uh, may have proven enough to trigger an arrest. So um, I had actually never heard of, heard of halogenated hydrocarbon sniffing before. Uh, it's a sentence I never thought I would say, and I had definitely never heard of sudden sniffing death, but something now that we are all aware of. Uh, anyone have questions for Eric about how this case went, uh, things he was concerned about, and what they did? Yeah, awesome. Eric, how long are they sensitized for? Yeah, that's a good question. So these halogenated hydrocarbons have a really large volume of distribution. And so this was a chronic user in an OB um, So she would potentially get sensitized like chronically. Very successful with this problem. Um, so uh, I think that's important to keep in mind if you see patients and you get this history that they pop the sniff thing, is that they may be predisposed to from any catecholamine kind of insert um, for arrhythmias. That's a good question. Got a Rudolph, so why did she seize? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this was a, it, we actually didn't think this was an actual seizure, just the appearance of someone. Yeah, and she did not have a good outcome. 
Uh, and then Claire's asking, anything we can do to treat the startle issue? Eric, did you guys talk about that? Um, we did. This was addressed in that, in that same talk that actually they said the, uh, the way to address it is to, to take, take away the thing that's causing it. So let the um, hydrocarbon wash themselves out. Great. So remove the keyboard cleaner. Um, great, Eric, thank you for the teaching there. So yeah, so this is kind of a rare toxidrome, but presenting with something that we should all be familiar with treating uh, immediately. All right, any final questions about sudden sniffing death from halogenated hydrocarbons? If you want to do some, like, think about your pressers you're using, like, you can take empty or non-empty if you want to hold kind of hold them in. So does that come up? Yeah, does that, that come up at all? Yeah. I mean, obviously, we needed to use empty drip for, because she didn't have any blood pressure. She had a lot of little runs of arrhythmia and PVC, which she had to kind of balance tolerating versus um, you know, going back into it. So after 24 hours, she didn't have any further arrhythmia. So if there was, had a lot of ecstasy, we were very concerned about that. Yeah, you know, I guess what you think of like, would you put like phenyl or like beta depressant? Yeah, like, like would you like try to match up the depressants or something? Yeah. yeah, that's a great yeah, thought. Too, and um, I don't, she didn't have enough blood pressure to warrant that. To be honest. Awesome. So I think another thing we can all add to our differential of when to use phenylephrine. So if you have a person in this situation, um, the sort of uh, more common corollary here, right, is this is why we use phenylephrine in people who have AFib with RBR, uh, is we want to sort of uh, take away the catecholamines that they're getting. And so if your person is going into AFib with RBR on norepi or epinephrine, maybe switching them to phenylephrine uh, would be a more common time where you would invoke that same principle. All right, and then uh, Alice is asking uh, which substances fall under the category of halogenated hydrocarbons. Alice, very good question. I don't have an answer outside of keyboard cleaner, um, but uh, yeah, spray paint. Presumably, any pressurized uh, aerosol will have some amount of halogenated hydrocarbon in it. Really good question. All right, so back to the top here. We've talked now about mushroom scombroid and sudden sniffing and death which frankly, I think we're all a little surprised is a thing. So case three here, this is probably gonna be the one that's most clinically high yield for you, everyone. Um, just probably saying a lot considering what I just talked about. So a uh, person brought in by ambulance at seven o'clock in the morning from their residence. EMS was found down in their own feces. Last normal was two days ago. Per the patient's son, they were talking yesterday, but son felt something was not right. Recently started back from for a UTI and missed HD yesterday. Difficult to obtain blood pressure as patient was moving and talking incoherently. So uh, if you saw the missed HD yesterday, this person is an ESRD patient. So I'll give you some more HPI here. Uh, that's not it. Eyes aren't good enough to look at all this stuff. All right, so there's your HPI. So uh, it's a 60 year old man with ESRD, diabetes, hef -pef. Last one normal was 48 hours prior to admission. Um, son arrived to the house and found him hunched against the wall. He asked if he was okay. He just said, I'm okay repeatedly. Uh, son said the father may have had an infection. He had a home health nurse who worked with his medications and his review systems was negative, but it's hard to take a review of his systems and someone who is mumbling incomprehensibly. Uh, he's unable to follow commands. He's got some lip smacking and he replies with an okay to all questions. Another person that uh, Katie uh, admitted uh, to UCH a couple months ago. So uh, everyone take 30 seconds uh, at your table and I want you to give me your big differential here. So top three, um, as common as you wanna get or as esoteric as you wanna get and what two tests you wanna get right off the bat. All right, everyone, let's uh, let's come back here. So uh, 
Uh, we'll go with, uh, hey, Ron, we're going to come back here. We're going to go with uh, Nemi. You're sitting close enough. I haven't called in yet. Uh, Nemi, how are you, what's your kind of top three differential uh, succinctly? And then how are you thinking about next steps, next questions, next tests? Um, I guess, and I guess, thank you for talking about what, um, yeah, I guess we're just setting it up. Uh, yeah, not being coherently, uh, like not moving well from the zone two seed. I think there's concerns for CDA, also with the whip smacking and just repetitive um, things we did late in terms of fever. Um, and then, uh, I think medications, obviously. Uh, Awesome. That's great. Uh, I think that's probably the exact right top three. So CVA, seizure, medications. Uh, I really like that. And I heard this group also talking. They were like, is the is the back from a red herring? Am I just telling you about the UTI to confuse you? I'm not sure. Okay, cool. So uh, another group, uh, what tests do you want to get or questions you want to ask? So you said EEG and what was the other one? Great, EEG and a CT head. So great, so I think hitting the two things that are most likely to uh, need emergent action are EEG and CT head, because uh, you saw that repetitive lip smacking behavior. All right, cool, so I will tell you that the EEG and the CT head are both negative, and this person continues to lip smack at the bedside and still is generally very, very altered. All right. Uh, Clara says point of care glucose. Is point of care glucose? Uh, good question, Clara. I can give you some labs here. Uh, there you go. So there are some labs. So um, I think we all love seeing creatinines for people that are on ESRD, something you probably don't necessarily have to report in this guy. But his BUN is only 50, his creatinine is 4.62, and his ALKFOS is elevated. I'll tell you that ALKFOS is uh, stable from baseline, so we don't need to focus too much on that. And Priscilla's asking, does he take metoclopramide? Priscilla, uh, if you could put in the chat, why are you asking about metoclopramide? Great, so extra pyramidal symptoms, perfect. Um, really good thought. I'll tell you that he does not use metoclopramide, but he does use two other medicines among many. He uses Thorazine and he uses Baclofen. So, um, he, this man, um, when we, I was his attending, Katie was his uh, intern, we consulted renal because he needed dialysis because he'd missed a couple of dialysis days. I'll tell you that he gets HD and he comes back to the room and he is normal. So um, take 30 seconds amongst yourselves knowing this history and knowing that he goes to HD and comes back normal. And I want you guys to tell me of the Thorazine or the Baclofen, which one of these is causing his acute presentation. All right. It was a, you had a 50, 50 chance. Uh, Mike, Mike's table. What do you guys think? Is this the Thorazine or is this the Backelman? It's the Thorazine. We got to vote for Thorazine. Great. Uh, anyone want to vote for Thorazine or vote Backelman? All right. I'll tell you, the answer here is it's actually Backelman. Uh, so why is it Backelman? So uh, anyone want to take a guess how we eliminate baclofen from our bodies, knowing the context of this case? Great. It is renally cleared. It's almost entirely renally cleared. And if you dialyze someone, you remove about 70% via dialysis. So baclofen, as opposed to Thorazine, is more likely to be renally cleared. Thorazine um, is less renally cleared, and pharmacy thought it was pretty unlikely to be causing it in this case. Um, cool. So baclofen, this person is indeed suffering from baclofen toxicity. So what does baclofen toxicity look like? Um, we talked about this in a prior tox conference, but does anyone know where baclofen acts? Like what receptor? Is 
Say again. No. So there's actually GABA. So baclofen is a GABA. I think it's a GABA B or GABA. There's two different types of GABA. It's a, it's a B. Great. So I was, I was not incorrect. It's a GABA B agonist. And so it's actually um, sort of like the model molecule for GABA B or whatever. And so um, all of our other GABA B stuff, right? So alcohol prop or GABA stuff, alcohol, propofol, all that other stuff, uh, baclofen toxicity is going to look similar to those. And so um, the somnolence, the confusion, all of that is pretty common with baclofen toxicity. So who gets this? people who can't clear. So people who are taking baclofen and get an AKI, people who are on dialysis and don't go to dialysis. And so the, the takeaway here is like, please do not give to people on ESRD because all it takes is one missed dialysis session. And this person goes from being a functioning uh, person to a baclofen, like basically zombie who can't talk or can't do anything uh, and will need to be admitted. The good news is once they get dialyzed, they're essentially cured of it. Um, but really a bad medicine to have around the house if someone's got uh, kidney disease. Um, the other reason this might be important is there was a recent study that came out looking at baclofen in the ICU patient population for alcohol withdrawal. Um, and it may, it may be helpful in that context. And so baclofen is not an uncommon medicine to see uh, either in the hospital for withdrawal or in the community for muscle spasms. Uh, this gentleman was taking it for hiccups, which is not an indication. Um, so just a good thing to be aware of. All right, so coming back up top. So what did we talk about today? We talked about scombroid poisoning, uh, which uh, Dr. Breitbach's team is magically somehow maybe seeing right now, which worked out really well. We talked about acute mushroom toxicity, baclofen toxicity, and then sudden sniffing death from halogenated hydrocarbons. Um, that's it. This is recorded. We'll post it online like always. But if anyone has any other questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, have a great day, and thank you all for participating.